that's my cue to begin, and I want to welcome you here today um, on this uh, this May Day in spring, and uh, I welcome one and all to Preventing Unjust War, a Catholic Argument for, for Selective Conscientious Objective Objection, excuse me, a presentation and conversation featuring Dr. Roger Bergman and the newest member of our Loyola faculty, Father, Father Patty Gilger of the Society of Jesus. Patty is going to facilitate our event today, and it really is uh, with he and Roger, their brainchild, and for reasons that Patty will adduce in a moment, um, and really for reasons that we have come to understand all too well, sadly. Uh, just a quick word about Patty before I hand the Zoom baton over to him. Father Patrick Gilger of the Society of Jesus is a priest of the Midwestern province, uh, a graduate of Creighton University, he has been a Jesuit since 2002, trained in philosophy and theology. In addition to sociology, he now primarily studies social theory, the sociology of religion, and secularity. His current research focuses on how communities of practice cultivate religious subjectivities uh, that are difficult to see and hear in a secular age, and how these unique sub subjectivities cultivate particular, quote, powers of publicity that can be deployed within an always already power inflected public sphere. Uh, Patty is a member of our affiliated faculty in Catholic studies and in the Hank Center Working Group in Catholic studies. He is also a contributing editor at America Media where he keeps his journalist teeth nice and sharp. Welcome Dr. Bergman, first of all, and welcome to you, Father Patty Gilger to the Zoom stage. Thank you everybody. Michael, always a great pleasure to uh, be with you and hear from you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, although my journalistic chops may need to rewrite my uh, my author bio with the verbiage that's in there, <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be here with you um, for this. You know, I think beautiful conversation, perhaps a difficult conversation um, about the problem of war, conscientious objection, conscience formation some of the saints who may hold us as models for this. Um, the problem of war, as many of us are aware, and the problem of violence just continues, uh, continues to be with us, especially because of the news that all of us are aware of yesterday of yet another um, mass shooting in the United States of America. So uh, to, to overcome maybe our tendency towards a pro forma um, noting of this, um, I want to just take a moment here at the very beginning of our event together to read um, a selection from the statement that was released by the Catholic Diocese of El Paso in Texas, but written by Bishop Mark Seitz. He ends this with a prayer, and so I ask you to, if you will, pray that prayer with me here. Bishop Seitz says, despite our experience with school shootings, with evil, we still cannot possibly fathom the loss of innocent children whose lives were snuffed out by a young man with a gun. We pledge to renew our efforts in the church to assist in finding ways to more effectively identify people at risk of such behavior and to push for reasonable limits to the proliferation of firearms. Our prayers are with the Uvalde community and we stand with them in faith and love and solidarity in the faith of, face of unbearable grief and pain. We pray that the love of Christ envelop the families of those that lost life yesterday. And so we pray together. God of peace, who are peace itself, and whom the spirit of discord cannot grasp, nor a violent mind receive, grant that those who are one in heart may persevere in what is good, and that those in conflict may forget evil and so be healed. Father, we beg this of you through Christ our Lord. Amen. In recognition of this uh, violence, if this was the only violence that we had to recognize, that would be you know, a much better situation for ourselves and for many. Um, but the problem of war is uh, not beginning and not an early one, a recent one, and, and certainly seems to be unabated in his procedures. Um, 2003, I remember just after I had joined the Society of Jesus, the war in Iraq began. We're all well aware of the 200,000 civilian deaths that took place at that time. Um, Pope Francis, over the years of his pontificate, has again and again reminded us that uh, World War III is proceeding piecemeal amongst in the globe at the moment. 
And if that weren't enough, we're all well aware of Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine, the suffering of the Ukrainian people and of our brothers and sisters, and of the very, very problematic and difficult uh, religious intertwinement with that war at the moment and the debate surrounding how the United States and the church are to support our brothers and sisters there. In the midst of these tensions, um, Dr. Bergman's book and his thought enters uh, with full force. Often he notes that Catholic pacifists blame the just war tradition for this kind of violence, um, thinking that the just war can, tradition has been and can be used to justify any war. And so therefore it has to be jettisoned. But his book, Preventing Unjust War, argues slightly differently. He says that the problem is not the just war tradition, but the unjust war tradition. Instead, he argues that ambitious rulers start wars that cannot be justified and still warriors continue to fight them. The problem then is that warriors are believed not to hold any responsibility for judging the justice of the wars they themselves are ordered to fight. His response to this very difficult situation is to advocate for what he calls selective conscientious objection, the right and the duty to refuse to fight in unjust wars. This, he says, is the solution. Dr. Bergman is a perfect person to help us with, uh, with this kind of argument. He currently is Professor Emeritus of Cultural and Social Studies at Creighton University, uh, my undergraduate alma mater, where he founded there the, and directed the Justice and Peace Studies program for nearly 20 years. Um, I remember Dr. Bergman well from my time at Creighton. He was one of the many faculty members who really formed my heart and mind into even considering uh, becoming a Jesuit and becoming a priest myself, and he helped me to take seriously um, the depth of the Catholic tradition in which I continue to be formed and want to be formed. I remember just one story very briefly. A good friend of mine, um, partly in, in provocation from Dr. Bergman's work that we had been reading, uh, decided, um, preferably decided, to travel with a group of uh, people from our university down to the School of the Americas protest back when it was held in Fort Benning, Georgia. This was probably in 2001, maybe 2000. And we returned from a long bus ride uh, from Georgia at that time and got off the bus uh, just in time to walk into the middle of Dr. Bergman's class where he was proceeding at that very moment to talk about just and unjust wars and consciousness formation, conscience formation. And those that entry into our class was I'm sure very disruptive for him as all teachers know and have, uh, have someone unexpected walk into the classroom in the middle of the session. But he incorporated us and our experiences beautifully, the things that we had just gone through, these powerful emotional experiences of empathy and pain and anger and vibrancy and hope for justice. I appreciate that and many other things about him. Uh, it's because of that and because I've just finished reading his book that we'll talk about here in a moment that I wanna just note one other thing about Dr. Bergman. Uh, in his own text, he notes that this tradition of advocating for just wars, particularly as we'll hear from him, the advocacy for the establishing of an international court staffed by perhaps educated Catholics that could adjudicate the justice or injustice of wars. He knows that this is not in fact a new idea. He is picking this up from many Many different sources throughout the long tradition that we have in the church. One particular sort citation, source, inspiration point that he cites in so doing is in fact not a Catholic, but the Protestant David Urquhart. In his book, he recounts the story of Urquhart petitioning the Vatican just prior to Vatican I to establish a transnational court to evaluate the justice or injustice of wars. Bert, Dr. Bergman calls Urquhart, I quote him, a knight errant for the just war tradition in an age of empire. Today we are joined and we'll get the chance to learn from another knight errant, hopefully a little less Don Quixote-ish in the just, for the just war tradition. Uh, Dr. Bergman, we're very grateful to have you here and very eager to learn from you today. Thank you very much for that lavish introduction. <laughs> um, actually the knight errant quotation is from John Howard Yoder, which I use a couple of times, but uh, it's appropriate to Mr. Urquhart, and thank you for putting me in any context remotely like that. Okay, let me go to my um, PowerPoint here. Okay, are we ready?
Well, there is the question and a very uh, provocative photograph to remind us uh, of the high stakes that we're talking of. Um, there's the title uh, and a photograph, uh, kind of the standard photograph of Franz Jagerstatter, uh, who is the subject of the first chapter of the book and really an inspiration for the book as a whole. I was very grateful that Drew Christensen took an interest in uh, this topic and, and uh, agreed to write a forward. Uh, he was a great uh, presence in the Catholic Church around these questions. We're sorry to have lost him just recently. So there really are uh, two brief quotations that uh, this book is an extended meditation on. One from St. Augustine, The City of God. And I've read this many times before it finally dawned on me, uh, the implications. The wise man will wage just wars, for unless the wars were just, he would not have to wage them. And in such circumstances, he would not be involved in war at all. So it is a just war argument, my book is, for the prevention of unjust war and therefore for war. The other quotation is from Aquinas in his commentary on the book of Job. There are two reasons why men especially deviate from justice. The first is because they defer to important persons, authority. The second is because they defer to the majority or conformity. And I try to address that throughout the book. Uh, Jagerstatter, as I say, is the inspiration and probably the last words he wrote before he was beheaded by the Nazi military are these. I cannot and may not take an oath in favor of a government that is fighting an unjust war. So we'll unpack all that. That, of course, is uh, Pope Benedict a uh, fellow German. He's conscripted at 16 into the German military. He served two years before deserting in 1945. But in 2007, uh, Pope Benedict beatified Franz Jagerstatter as a martyr of the faith. That martyrdom is considered the first um, miracle on the way to his canonization. And I'll suggest what I think the second miracle ought to be later on. We only know about Franz Jagerstatter because of, of this uh, esteemed gentleman, Gordon Zahn, who was a Catholic and a sociologist and a pacifist during World War II. Uh, after the war, he, uh, which he spent in a, a, an alternative service camp, along with uh, hundreds of other Catholic pacifists, undertook research into how it could be that the entire German and Austrian hierarchy um, went along with Hitler's wars, and that resulted in his book, German Catholics and Hitler's Wars, 1962. That is a great book. More people ought to know about it. Uh, in the course of writing that book, he discovered the story of Franz Jagerstatter, um, who was uh, otherwise unknown, unheralded, even in his own small village of St. Radigan. He was a, a peasant farmer, with only an eighth grade education, uh, but he had the insight that to fight for Hitler was to be a murderer and to be a murderer was to condemn himself to hell. He said that those who want to find the right way to eternal well-being should not walk with the majority of people who are usually timid about making sacrifices and they should not entrust themselves to leaders whose actions differ from their words. Now, I doubt Jagerstatter had read Thomas's commentary on the book of Job, but he's tracking him exactly. The, why do men deviate from justice? Because they obey a, authority, because they conform to the majority. He did neither. He said, further, we are expected not only to offer sacrifice, but also to attack, rob, and even murder people so that a national socialist world empire will come about. Nevertheless, 
People who decide not to obey the state's commands are accused of doing something seriously sinful. Wouldn't it be worthwhile to learn from the lives of the saints so that we would know how the first Christians would have responded to today's evil commands? Uh, sociologically, Franz is referring to his reference group, the early martyrs. So um, I realized in, in talking about Jägerstadter several times that I probably shouldn't assume that everybody immediately agrees that he was a great moral exemplar. So I'm going to rehearse for you why I think some people uh, might resist this idea. So Jägerstadter was wrong because Hitler's wars were right and just. He was a mistake. Not, people, not many people would admit that today. Jägerstadter was wrong, even though Hitler, Hitler's wars were unjust, because a citizen must serve his country right or wrong. He was unpatriotic. Jägerstadter was wrong because it is wrong to disobey lawful authority. Romans 13. He was disobedient. Jägerstadter was wrong because he had no authority or expertise to make such a decision. He was incompetent. Jägerstadter was wrong because he betrayed his fellow citizens, especially those who accepted induction and risked their lives as soldiers on his behalf. He was a shirker. Jägerstadter was wrong because he could have accepted induction and then avoided killing. He was imprudent. Jägerstadter was wrong because he could have accepted induction as an unarmed medic. He was a purist. And this is the one I think most people would resonate with. Jägerstadter was wrong because he left his wife without a husband, his three young daughters without a father, his widowed mother without a son, and all of them without a provider. He was selfish. I've had students say that in class. Jägerstadter was wrong even if he was right, because his solitary witness, the name of the great book about him by Zahn, would make no difference. He was a loser. He wasted his life. On the other hand, I would argue that Jägerstadter was right because he acted upon a sincere and well-formed conscience. He was true to the truth as he knew it. Jägerstadter was right because Hitler's wars were wrong, and his church, his country, and his village were wrong in supporting Hitler's wars. He was courageous. Jägerstadter was right because it is better to suffer injustice than to inflict it. He was noble. That's a very Socratic idea. Jägerstadter was right because it is wrong to swear unconditional obedience to any political authority, especially a tyrant like Hitler. He was astute. Jägerstadter was right because it is better to obey God than men from Acts. His soul was at stake. So what is, the, uh, what is the status of, of Jagerstatter's witness uh, in the teaching of the church today? Uh, it's very little has been paid attention to this. It's a, a very brief glimpse of the church's thought about this, but this is from the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, published in 2004 during the John Paul uh, papacy. Conscientious objectors who, out of principle, refuse military service in those cases where it is obligatory because their conscience rejects any kind of recourse to the use of force or because they are opposed to the participation in a particular conflict must be open to accepting alternative forms of service. So this is an endorsement from a Catholic point of view, not only of pacifist objection to all wars, but a just war objection to particular wars. That's recognized now by the church on the global stage. And this all goes back uh, to the church's uh, very strong teaching on conscience. Uh, 
summarized in this famous statement by St. John Henry Newman, which is quoted in the Catechism. Conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ. I believe he says that the Pope may be the vicar of Christ, but conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ. And we'll, I have an entire chapter that really unpacks how that could be true. Uh, it's not just the church that's paying attention to uh, these questions. Uh, this uh, anthology I'm quoting here, When Soldiers Say No, is uh, exploration mainly by philosophers uh, on the question. And the editors in their introduction make this uh, statement, which is quite true to the Catholic tradition. The case for selective conscience objection rests in large part on Aquinas's assertion that a person should always obey his or her conscience, even if there is a possibility of being wrong. A soldier who cannot in good conscience fight in a given war would be acting immorally if he or she nevertheless chose to fight whether it would be due to fear of punishment or any other reason. Aquinas did, however, add an important proviso. Conscience needs to be informed. And that's a large part of what this book is about. Uh, but this is, this is not a, a, a new idea. It's not a modern idea. Uh, this goes back to at least the 15th century. Uh, this is as good a summary as my book in, in medieval language as you could hope for, uh, written by a, a woman, an uh, aristocrat who was well-educated, clearly wrote a book. Every man who quite properly wishes to expose himself to war should, before he becomes involved, be well informed of the nature of the quarrel in order to know whether the challenge is just or not. Let him inquire if this war has first been judged by competent jurists or lawyers, or whether it may be for the cause of defense. You should know that if the quarrel is unjust, he that exposes himself in it condemns his soul. If Jagerstatter had ever come across that, he said, he would have said, amen. So, um, one of my actually favorite chapters of the book is about moral injury. Uh, that's a new term. Um, it's not the same thing as post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's a, a big part of that chapter. So I look at uh, five uh, authors who've uh, written about moral injury in their own experience. The first is from a classic uh, reflection by, by a professional philosopher on his experience in World War II the so-called good war. Uh, Jagling Gray wrote, there is a line that a man dare not cross, deeds he dare not commit, regardless of orders and the hopelessness of the situation, for such deeds would destroy something in him that he values more than life itself. That is a kind of non-religious way of talking about uh, self-condemnation by doing something you can't fully support. I uh, had to quote this line from Drew Christensen, the chapter on moral injury is worth the price of the book. So I, I look at five warriors, one from, from World War II you just met, two from Vietnam, two from Iraq, and work through um, to a definition of moral injury as distinct from post-traumatic stress disorder. Now let's just cut right to the, the definition, although this definition and the discussion of that is much less interesting than the actual narratives of those five soldiers. Moral injury in warfare is caused by a betrayal of what's right by legitimate authority or an individual's perpetrating, failing to prevent, witnessing, or learning about an incident or its aftermath that violates deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. That definition is drawn from two secular authorities uh, on moral injury. Uh, I like to reduce it to more Catholic social teaching kind of language. Moral injury is a violation of human life and rights producing anger, guilt, and shame. It can overlap with PTSD, but if there is anger, guilt, and shame, it's probably moral injury and not just PTSD. Really, the, the linchpin of this book 
uh, aside from conscience itself, is, is an argument by Jeff McMahon in his book, Killing in War. Uh, he is the chief alternative to Michael Walzer's very influential book from the late 1970s. Uh, his book, the, uh, Killing in War, is published uh, just in 2009. He's now at Oxford. Uh, he wrote an article, The Prevention of Unjust Wars, uh, five years later, and as the title suggests, that's obviously uh, a, an article that I've relied on. Uh, he says this, we should agree that young people who are commanded by their rulers to risk their lives in order to kill others deserve moral guidance that we know they will not receive from those who seek to use them in this way. So if a government orders young men and women into war, it's not likely that that same government will sit them down for a seminar on the ethics of war and peace. Somebody else needs to do that. Uh, Ken Himes, Franciscan theologian at Boston College, wrote a nice endorsement of my book. Uh, and I thought he, in his typical way, just absolutely nailed the, the gist of it. Bergman's fine book addresses how to prevent unjust war by issuing three challenges to the pacifist tradition and its absolute presumption against any just use of violent force, to the just war tradition and its historical deference to political authority rather than the conscience of the individual, and three, to the Catholic Church as a moral educator forming consciences. It might be that a fourth uh, challenge could be issued here, and that's to um, the military, all militaries, to take this question seriously themselves. And we'll pay a little attention to that in a minute. So here's the second miracle I'm hoping for. Perhaps the second miracle needed for Jagerstatter's canonization could be that the Catholic Church of the 21st century takes the just war tradition in relation to personal conscience as seriously as he did. To Blessed Franz's ancient Church of the Martyrs could be added a modern court of Catholic moral authority that would issue judgments about potential or current wars. Uh, and a, a baseline of that would be uh, the statement from St. Romero. Uh, he's not the only one who said this, of course. No soldier is obliged to obey an order contrary to the law of God. But every soldier, every citizen needs moral formation and moral guidance. I think this is just an exquisitely accurate and troubling uh, statement from Ralph Potter, who, who had some influence on the bishop's 1983 pastoral letter on war and peace, the challenge of peace. Under existing law, Unless one would be unwilling to fight against a new Hitler as a pacifist, one may be compelled to fight for a new Hitler because selective conscientious objection is not allowed in any country in the world with one exception. Uh, I'm anticipating that one of the first objections to this argument has to do, um, and in fact, it, it, it was stated in, in, in a very formal way by Justice Thurgood Marshall in writing majority opinion against selected conscience objection. And the argument is that we can't have warriors, uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, deciding which wars they want to fight and which they don't. To which I would answer, do we really fear that warriors would refuse to defend their country if it were attacked unjustly? Do we really believe warriors knowledgeable of the just war tradition and guided by the Catholic Church and similar authoritative bodies would regard the decision as akin to the pick and choose of a cafeteria line? It is an insult to the honor of warriors to suggest that selective conscience objection would express a mere preference, like choosing roast beef rather than fried chicken. So, as promised, only one nation permits, even encourages SCO. And when I presented this talk at uh, Creighton uh, several months ago, I paused long enough to, to ask the audience 
Anybody want to guess who that was? And somebody got it right. So you might be asking yourselves, what's going to be on the next slide? Uh, Lieutenant Jurgen Rose is an exponent and practitioner of post-World War II German military culture of inner Führung, inner leadership or, or conscience. He is both a scholar of that tradition, that's how I learned about this, and a practitioner. That is, he was a lieutenant colonel in the German Bundeswehr and was ordered to participate in the Iraq War and refused. But because of post-World War II, Germany's new military culture, when he made his decision known to his superior officer without any fanfare, although it was, it was much publicized, of course, in the German press, he was simply transferred to another assignment. His conscience was honored, and indeed, the post-World War II German military culture honors culture. Every, every soldier is still a citizen and a citizen of conscience. Um, one of the early um, German leaders after World War II said in the 20th century, Germany had suffered a massive slumber of conscience. And the German military has done um, not an absolutely perfect, but strong effort to rid itself of the possibility that ever again, they could fight an unjust war. So uh, by the end, toward the end of the book, as I was writing, I began to think, well, this is really a, a, the question of what is the relationship between legitimate authority and personal conscience? So uh, in, in part, large part, because I was a college student during the Vietnam War, I was in ROTC for two years, and then the lottery got me off the hook. Uh, I, I've been thinking uh, about this question uh, quite a bit. And, in, in the course of teaching the, the uh, War and Peace course that Patty took 20 some years ago, um, began to see more and more that you had to really think hard about legitimate authority. So um, the Pentagon Papers provide an inside view of uh, decades of American thinking about Vietnam at the highest level from Truman, to, to Nixon, both Democrats and Republicans in the White House. And uh, I, I do kind of a deep dive into the Pentagon Papers, which everybody knows about, but few people have actually read, I think. I only read it in the course of writing this book. Arendt says in a paper on the papers, what caused the disastrous defeat of American policies and armed intervention in Vietnam was indeed no quagmire, but the willful, deliberate disregard of all facts, historical, political, geographical, for more than 25 years. So this is the, this is the legitimate authority that young people in this country were supposed to obey unquestionably, and questioningly, uh, I don't think so. So why do wars continue to plague us? What can be done to prevent them? Well, just a reminder of what's at stake. There are 58,000 names, something like that, on that uh, very moving monument uh, in, on the Washington Mall called The Wall, uh, a pilgrimage site. Um, how did they end up there? Why did they end up there? How do we make sure there's never a need for another wall like that? Catholic pacifists blame the just war tradition for the church. This is what Patty was quoting earlier. That tradition, they say, can be invoked to justify any war, and so it must be jettisoned. This book argues that the problem is not the just war tradition, but the unjust war tradition. Ambitious rulers start wars that cannot be justified, and yet warriors continue to fight them. Russia and its invasion of Ukraine is the imperfect, perfect example of that. The problem is that warriors are believed not to hold any responsibility for judging the justice of wars they are ordered to fight. However unjust, 
a command renders any war just for the obedient warrior. That's, in fact, until fairly recently, that was the teaching of the church. That was what the, Arch the Bishop of Linz told Franz Jagerstagger when he had an interview with him. This book argues that selective conscience objection, the right and duty to refuse to fight unjust wars is the solution. Strengthening the just war tradition depends on a heightened role for the personal conscience of the warrior, as in German inner fearing. That in turn depends on a heightened role for the church in forming and supporting consciences and judging the justice of particular wars. And we need a, a special court comprised of international experts in the just war tradition, international affairs history, all of that, um, to guide all of us in thinking about these difficult questions. But it all comes back to uh, the question of conscience. Uh, and that's why it is the ultimate authority. Uh, there's a uh, uh, there's my email address. I would be happy to have people uh, write me about this. Uh, we'll take some questions now, but if we don't get to yours, I encourage you to contact me through that email. I'll be happy to en engage you in in uh, whatever your question might be. Okay, Patty, let's go for some Q and A. Roger, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you the solo applause here yeah. uh, since there are many listening yeah. who are not able to, to give it to you in this way. Yeah. Um, though, you know, one of the first things I wanted to ask is if you could um, tell us two stories that kind of, you know, maybe follow on the heels of one another. The first is the historical one. One of the, the most persuasive and interesting chapters for me in your book was your discussion of Jägerstadter, of, you know, Blessed yeah. Franz Jägerstadter. Can yeah. you describe for us a little bit of the pressures he was under and the effort at conscience formation that he undertook? And particularly, you brought up just a moment ago, this, uh, the conversations that he had with his own pastor, yeah. who I think was also the bishop. And so yeah. how did those proceed? How did he come yeah. to an, a place where he could yeah. have the courage to do what he did? Yeah, yeah. It is a bit of a mystery. I think that's why Pope Benedict could call this uh, a martyr's miracle. Uh, Jagerstadter was a kind of typical Austrian peasant young man, farmer. He had an eighth grade education. He went to a one room schoolhouse for 50 or 60 students of all different ages. Uh, he apparently was a good student and an avid reader, but he had no education beyond eighth grade. I can only imagine that when he did get serious about his religion in his 20s, that he may have borrowed from the library of the pastor, but that's never mentioned. I don't know how he learned about the just war tradition. And he doesn't quote documents. He doesn't name specific criteria. He just had a very strong sense that wars, were, if they weren't just, were about murder. And he wasn't going to murder. So uh, in his later 20s, he fell in love and married Francisca. It's been said that she also should be canonized. Uh, she was at his uh, beatification ceremony in, in Linz, uh, whatever it was, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and he got very serious about his religion at that point, to the point that the other villagers no doubt conventionally religious as Franz had been at best, thought he was a little nuts. He would sing hymns as he was out in the fields, um, began uh, returning a, a free Hitler whenever somebody would walk by and Heil Hitler, and free Hitler, fui on Hitler, um, began refusing relief from uh, the Nazi uh, relief organizations, uh, left the peasant organization when it continued to cooperate. Uh, he was drafted, conscripted. Um, there was a couple stages there, but eventually he, he actually did take military training for several weeks. And he, he wrote home that he, he was actually very good on the, the marksmanship range. Um, he, didn't, he, he was a third order Franciscan, um, but he had no problem picking up a gun and doing target practice, but when he started imagine shooting at, at the French or the Polish or the Czechs or whoever, he couldn't do it. In fact, mm -hmm. remarkably, he imagined that if he were a Frenchman or 
at the other end of Hitler's war effort, that he would take up arms against Hitler to defend his own country. So that, that makes it clear that he was not a pacifist. Okay? And it's to Zahn's credit that he does not try to turn Jagerstatter into a pacifist like himself. So he, he was conscripted. He um, was put on trial for undermining military morale and uh, found guilty. The judges tried to talk him into um, uh, confessing, uh, taking a lighter sentence, and finally offered him an appointment as a, as a medic, which he said, I could do because I would not be killing people. I could be caring for people who were wounded. But he, he then realized that he would still have to take an oath of absolute obedience to Hitler, Hitler by name, not to the German constitution, but to Hitler by name. He says, I cannot do that. I will not do that. And so he was beheaded. Um, the interesting question put to him was, well, why did the German and Austrian bishops not have the same insight you did? He said, well, maybe they weren't well prepared for this. And you're thinking, Franz has an eighth grade education. Those bishops are all highly educated. So it doesn't have to do with what happens in a classroom, although obviously I think that's a big part of what we ought to be doing. Um, he had a famous dream uh, shortly after uh, the Anschluss, the bloodless takeover of Austria, his home country by Germany, famous dream in which he sees a train uh, with children, especially running to get on board. And he, as he's watching this dream in his mind, he, he comes eventually to realize that the train represents the Nazi regime and that it's on its path to hell. Um, I think this is very instructive because there's a question about when this dream is dated. And Zahn, I think, is right that it came after the Anschluss and after the advent of Hitler Youth in Austria. So it was informed by his understanding of what was going on around him. Um, but he, di he didn't immediately think of it as the Nazi train, only in reflection some years later. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost as if he had a private revelation. Mm -hmm. uh, where the, how you explain that dream um, coming deep out of his subconscious, but that subconscious was paying attention to what was going on in the world. There you go. Well, and one of the most important things there, as you say, so maybe e even if he did have a private revelation, you know, one of my own experiences as a Jesuit, I do a lot of spiritual direction. I have conversations with people about their own spiritual lives. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that. Everyone I have ever met, maybe there's somebody out there who doesn't, but everybody I've ever met has had living experiences of the living God. And mm -hmm. the thing that is difficult, though, is that most people don't trust them. Mm -hmm. Like most people don't don't trust those experiences yeah. and instead trust, you know, as Aquinas, you were mentioning, say, we'll trust a leader or we'll trust everyone else. And yeah. so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and maybe you have an example of this from your own teaching experience or from your own life experience, but I know you taught members of ROTC at Creighton yeah. for years, for years about these things. And do you have any, um, any examples from that experience with these young men and women, helping them to understand their own potential responsibility and uh, to form their conscience and then to yeah. enact this kind yep. of conscience. Yes, a lot of conversations uh, uh, with uh, senior ROTC cadets over the years about this. Uh, I was always impressed that with one exception, their uh, department chair, the, the major, the lieutenant colonel who was teaching the class, took these questions more seriously or could engage them more seriously than the students did. I mean, they're there trying to get through their military training at that level and anticipating a commission and all that. The officers who are in charge have had to deal with these questions more directly. In so real life. I, I, I'll, with one exception, I don't know, there must have been 10 different people I worked with, eight anyway. And they all took these questions very seriously. We're, we're glad to have somebody come in and address uh, 
these ethical questions with their senior students. But let me tell you one story. I, I couldn't tell you now whether he was before or after your time at Creighton, Patty. Um, he was in ROTC, but he took my course and he took my wife's course on world religions, Dr. Wendy Wright, and he read about the, the pacifist traditions in India. And in my course, although this, I was not trying to convince anybody to be a pacifist, that, that was an option, certainly. Uh, he had a coalescence of conscience. And he decided he could not continue his ROTC training. Wow. But, this, but he was third or fourth year into it. His parents were both full board colonels in the military. So he went to the, the, the military chair and said, uh, I've had a crisis of conscience. I, I cannot continue. Uh, how do I get out? And the guy said, well, you have to repay everything we've put into your tuition and books for the last three years. Well, what do you think his parents said to the request that they co-sign a loan for him? That's not going to happen. So he, I, don't, I, I presume he was discerning on this profoundly, praying. He was, he was not Catholic, as I recall. But he came to the realization that he could continue his military training and request entry into the chaplaincy corps. Wow. So he went to seminary, I think paid for by the military, and became a chaplain as, as a pacifist. Um, so I've lost touch with him. I, I would love to know whether he you know, stayed in the military how this played out, you know, was was he still in the military when the Iraq war started? And did he have conversations with fellow uh, soldiers about these kinds of things? But that's the story that leaps out to me, a real a profound crisis of conscience. Thank you. Yeah, very powerful. We have um, really some lovely questions from the from the audience here. I'd like to bring some of those in. Um, this is a question from a, a recently graduated Loyola University student. Um, he wants to know, uh, uh, this person wants to know, does do you think that the placing of moral responsibility that you're advocating for on the warrior rather than just on their leadership parallels in any way this 20th century developments and the efforts of democratization within the church since Vatican II and Gaudium et Spes? So this person's thinking especially about the laity of the priesthood and the invitation into leadership within the yeah. religious denominations yeah. there. Um, this is asked a question asked by Emma. Yes, yes, that's a good question, Emma, and I think you're exactly right. Uh, uh, Professor Duffy at Marquette many years ago, I think he told me he was going to be listening in, wrote a column, I think, for America on that very topic, the democratization of the just war tradition. Uh, David DeCoss at Santa Clara, professor of moral theology, wrote a nice endorsement of the book and as teaching it, I think, has argued that we have to democratize the understanding of political authority within Catholic social teaching. Okay? And we have to be much more skeptical about the legitimacy of the authority that we are, to which we are supposed to be obedient. We have way too many examples of legitimate authority out, and out lying to the public. Um, so one of the questions often comes up, well, is how is some ordinary citizen, some soldier supposed to know all the ins and outs of this particular war? You know, and you say, well, why would you expect the leadership, given our history, to provide you with the information you know? They may have secret information, but they're also keeping information secret from you that you have a right to know and need to know to make a decision. Uh, so yes, I think I think it is a democratization that I don't mean in the book to bypass the role of military leadership. Um, Catholics in the military, whether they are buck privates or generals, should be exposed to the same conscience formation. And obviously, uh, officers have a lot more responsibility, and so should take that responsibility even more seriously. Um, so it's not an either or, it's a both and. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that really struck me in reading the book 
is that is your imagination of what might happen. Like, you know, I think I think that can be one of the most important parts of, you know, we were here in the Ignatian tradition, the Jesuit tradition, that Ignatius takes the act of imagination so deeply seriously yeah. in helping people cultivate an experience of God that they can trust, maybe cultivate some of these, you know, alternative reference groups that you discover, you know, discuss right. with regard to Blessed Franz Jagerstatter. Yeah. Um, but I, I loved this, this, uh, the images, the imagination that you depicted of what might happen if we were a little more successful yeah. in cultivating some of these alternative reference groups. Can you paint that picture for us? of yep. what might happen, different levels of the military, if we yep. were successful in helping people cultivate their consciousness. Yeah, well, I, I do that with a little hesitancy in the book, because, you know, it's a hypothetical, it's a counterfactual, some might say it's a fantasy. But I just pose the question, what would have been different if my proposal, uh, or something like it, had been in place in before the turn of the century, before the turn of the millennium. And then we have 9-11 and the country's in mortal fear. And the administration plays on that, I think, to send us not only into Afghanistan, where the terrorists had trained, but two years later into Iraq. Okay? The Pope spoke out frequently against the invasion, the pending invasion, the US bishops raised serious questions about it. Um, but there, there was no kind of larger authoritative statement. What if there had been an international Catholic court, as I have imagined, uh, composed not only of people who knew the just war tradition inside and out, but from both left and right, you know, a, a broad group, uh, international affairs specialists, uh, historians of the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, people who would bring all the expertise needed to make an informed decision. Because that, it was public for months. You know, there were millions of people protesting against the potential invasion in Europe before it happened. So it, the debate was going on. What if there had been an authoritative Catholic body, not just the lone voice of the Pope, however authoritative that might be for Catholics, not just the bishops raising some questions, but an authoritative statement, you know, of considerable depth that was made public. It's, I would say it's, this is not forcing the consciences of Catholics in the military. It's trying to inform them. They still are responsible for making their own decision. Okay, um, so that that is what I would imagine uh, happening the next time around. So there is a discussion in the book about this is not an argument just for protecting the consciences of individuals, but of creating something that would look more like civil disobedience on a broad enough scale that it would make a difference, even if it's not actually put in place, but just a potential. Had there been a Catholic court, had there been a, a statement by that court, court uh, weighing in against an invasion of Iraq, uh, what if the administration, the, the US administration said, if we have even five or 10% of the Catholics in the military refuse to go, we might be in trouble because it would not then be just Catholics, it would be other Christians, it would be Jewish people, it would be Muslims, it would be secular people of good conscience and so forth. Uh, so I think there is a potential deterrent effect if there were a body that would stand up to what we now know to be the lies of the administration. It's excellent. Um, one of the questions that we have here asked by a member of the audience is, do we have any examples either in the past or maybe this potential cultivation of a, a second, um, a sec potential second miracle, as you mentioned, for yeah. Blessed Franz? Like, are there anything that we can look to either in the past yeah. or in the future for signs of hope here? Yeah, yes, definitely. Uh, well, I, I've already mentioned the, the German military transformation. Uh, that's in place. Uh, now I give four other examples in the book. One dates to pre-imperial Rome. Uh, they 
there was a college of priests known as the Fetials, F-E-T-I-A-L-S, whose job it was to conduct uh, a consult with the, the, the rulers on international affairs. And they were the representative of the Roman gods uh, in, the, in the polity. And before Rome could decide to go to war, the Fetials had to sign off on it. And, and we don't, I don't know the whole history, or I don't, I haven't come across that of the actual cases that they maybe had to deal with, but, but the scholars of that period, long, long ago, said there's no reason to think that this wasn't taken quite seriously. Of course, it could mean that the Fatiels sometime would approve of a, of a war because another country had broached their territory or something like that. Um, so it wasn't, um, it wasn't cynical, according to the scholars of that tradition. So that would be one. And you mentioned David Urquhart, the Scottish Presbyterian, uh, who before Vatican I became convinced that the Catholic dress war tradition uh, was the solution to the problems. He saw it at that time. He got support from Cardinal Manning and the other bishops of Catholic bishops of, of the British Isles. Uh, an intervention was written, it was presented, it was on the agenda for, for Vatican I. Uh, Pope Pius, the, no, yes, Pius the Ninth uh, assured him that it would be taken up. And then, irony and irony, uh, the Crimean War broke out and the Vatican Council was suspended and it was never taken up. Wow. Uh, but, there, but at that point, the, the highest uh, authorities in the Catholic Church were apparently willing to entertain the idea. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's amazing to imagine what might have happened if that, yeah. you know, if the war, yeah. as you mentioned, hadn't right. broken off that part of Vatican I and we right. had gotten something other than, you know, right. people infallibility out of the, out of the right. meetings. Right. Um, we do have another question here that's asking about the uh, the current military culture of the German military that yeah. you've mentioned. This is from yeah. uh, Fritz Heinzen, and he asks, um, he recognizes maybe that inner Führung, Führung, I'm mispronouncing my German is utterly terrible. Um, yeah. He says it's not well understood outside of Germany, but he asks, he wants to know if you have looked at all in depth at Wolf Graf von Baudissin and his efforts to develop it for the Bundeswehr. Uh Thank you for that question. It's so wonderful when you get a question you can actually answer. <laughs> <laughs> Baudison, uh, I know this only from that one article by Jurgen Rose that I referred to. You saw his picture. Um, Baudison is the intellectual author, apparently, of this idea of inner Führung. That he, he, I would like to know more about him. He, he actually talked about demilitarizing the military. And by that he meant doing away with the tradition of unconditional obedience. Okay. Uh, and, and so that in germ was implanted in the, the first constitution after World War II, but not until much more recently did a, a high court in Germany actually kind of put some meat on that. It was when uh, some of the, the officers began objecting to a deployment to Iraq or Afghanistan. Okay. And it became clear at that point that the that in fact German soldiers, military people do have the right of objection to particular wars, and it's handled administratively. Uh, no, no negative repercussions. If if Lieutenant Jurgen Rose is retired, it's because he decided to retire, not because he was discharged dishonorably or something like that. Yeah. Right. Right. But there's not. A, I haven't found a lot of information in English uh, on that, apart from the article by by Rose. That's that's clearly the best one. It's in that anthology I referred to. When soldiers say no, I would love to hear more about that from people who can read the German. Uh, I'm looking forward to this question. Now that now that you're a fully emeritus professor, your German yeah. practice can begin and to translate oh, yeah, right. all of this for us. Yeah. You got a long wait, Patty. We, <laughs> That's we, not going to happen. <laughs> we have a we have a serious question, a series of questions here from Thad Crouch, and I'll just pick one of them that I think is actually very interesting about 
um, selective conscientious objection. He's asking about um, COVID vaccination. So this is kind of an interesting inversion, but I think he's yeah. seeing something that's actually very interesting and, and precise here. He asks, uh, since Archbishop of the US military archdiocese has recently told Catholic troops that they can, under, they can refuse COVID vaccinations, does this open, he wonders, new opportunities for the military archdiocese <laughs> to actually promote selective conscientious objection to refuse other kinds of orders. Yeah. I would be interested to know what the uh, military vicariate, the archbishop for the military, uh, has to say about selective conscientious objection. The U.S. bishops as a body have been on record repeatedly since the time of Vietnam in favor of selective conscientious objection. I, I don't know what that has meant for the military archbishop, whether he has done anything to promote awareness of that within the ranks. Um, it's interesting that this comes up, the selective conscience objection to, comes up as a matter of vaccines, which is about protecting yourself and your loved ones, but the question of, do, am I allowed to kill other people with weapons, sometimes of mass destruction, that's not yeah. so readily uh, imperative as just, yeah. it boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. Um, Anyway, so <laughs> you're you're not the only one whose mind is boggled about this, yeah. Roger. Um, yeah. let let me actually we ha let me turn to another question here. We have yeah. a, a beautiful question actually from David Koss. He's writing in oh. and wants to ask you. Um, I'm just going to read him in full quote. He says, "Actually, I'm wondering if Roger, if you might speak." to how we educate students at all levels of Catholic education about matters like these. I think that's one of the strongest points and implications of the book, not yeah. so much at the level of something like an international Catholic court, right. but at right. the level of basic assumptions in parishes and schools and universities about how we as Catholics think about war yeah. and how we expect yeah. the government to involve us in matters of war. Yes, um, great question, David. And I know you're doing your part at Santa Clara, but it's gotta start sooner than that. Uh, I think, I don't know at what point, I think once uh, children are maybe junior high, age of reason, 13 or so, according to the moral development and cognitive development literature, adolescents are basically young adults. I have a whole chapter on that in the book, right? So they can begin to engage these very serious questions uh, in a course, even in junior high school. And to speak directly to this, I don't think there's a Catholic high school in the country who shouldn't have a course in Catholic social teaching and a strong component on the just war tradition. Um, I would be interested in, it would be fascinating to do a survey. Are there, what are there, 400 some uh, high schools, um, 40 or 50 Jesuit high schools, it would be fascinating to know how many of them have taken up the call. And the bishops themselves have said repeatedly that we need to educate all Catholics in this tradition. Um, but my guess is that for uh, you and any parish, you would find a handful of people who had much of an awareness of the just war tradition at all. Uh, it's just, it's, it's just sad. Because, it, because it's it's a pro, it's a life issue, obviously, you know. And 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 Catholic Church takes such pride in being a pro-life church, a, a culture of life church, and and we have the these teachings on the books, but they don't they don't get filtered down um, to the people in the pew, as we say. Somehow that that's not a problem with with abortion. Excuse me for saying so. Nobody in the Catholic Church is unaware of the Church's teaching on abortion, despite the fact that it's a political question, not just a moral question, it's a political question. So at some level, pastors, religious educators are willing to embrace that question, even though it's all about politics, policy. But we don't want to talk about war because that's politics. Mm -hmm. So we, we've, got some, we've got some serious work to do. <laughs> Uh, to get to the point where we can we can claim to be a fully pro-life culture of life church if if 
our young people are not learning uh, the, the serious matter of conscience in regard to war. Yeah, it's very well said. It's very well said, Roger. And I think this, this uh, question of conscience formation is just so it's so deeply pressing upon us in our times today. Um, you know, one of the one of the questions that's really occurred to me these days is about um, the current war that's going on in Ukraine and and Russia. And one of those, you know, there are some really difficult questions that we've had seen Pope Francis attempt to face in the midst of this today. Um, so, you know, we've noted that even though Catholic teaching has, you know, we have very clear policies, that countries have the right to defend themselves under certain circumstances. Some of Pope Francis's, you know, current statements seem perhaps a little vague, you know, even saying that he's not in quite sure whether in the Corriera de la Sera, saying he's not quite sure whether it's acceptable to send arms to Ukraine at the particular moment here. Um, do you have any thoughts on how the Catholic Church could be a voice for clarity of uh, responsibility of the kind of role we ought to have as Catholics and Americans, you know, sending support to our sisters and brothers in Ukraine there. Ought that be military support? Are there other kinds? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I haven't followed the Pope's comments real closely on this. I, I know he has said something uh, to the Russian patriarch, the Orthodox patriarch that was urging him not to identify simply with uh, a religious nationalism that would baptize, as it were, any war. Um, I think that, that's, that's to the point. Um, but if nations have a right to defend themselves, and no pope has ever denied that, mm -hmm. even, always as a last resort, of course, proportionately with discrimination and so forth. Um, that cannot mean that other nations don't have the right, even duty, to support a just war. The question is, what is the most effective policy means to do that? And there, there are certainly moral dimensions to that, but that seems to me um, that maybe is not something the Pope himself would have great insight or expertise in any more than I do, you know? Uh, but um, it seems that many commentators in the US are generally supportive of the, the no boots on the ground, but military support of the Biden administration and European states. Uh, and that, that has seemed generally in line with, with the just war tradition, uh, as I understand it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know it's a very difficult question, right? I'm sorry to put you on the spot about it, but yeah. I feel like it's something important for us to discuss. Yes, yes. Well, and obviously the, the, in the background, or maybe not even the background, the foreground, is the question of, of nuclear arms. And Without I, question. I, I think um, probably some of the, the caution of the Biden administration and the European heads of state is if they push Putin too much with their own forces, for example, on the ground, that might push Putin in his desperation or his bravado or wherever it would be to use nuclear weapons. And that clearly would be the worst outcome for everybody. So it's a very delicate, I think, balancing match. Uh, it's hard to think about delicacy on something as dire as this and with many lives lost and more lives to be lost. But um, yeah, I think that's that's the difficulty of the situation. Well, I agree with you very much, but I also think that the word you chose there, delicacy, is the right one for the moment. And I think it's also the right one to describe much of what you do in the text, in the manuscript itself. And so I think it's something to be really proud of. I hope you are very proud of it. Like as a sociologist myself, what I want to say is that um, I am always on the lookout for what we might say like supra individual, you know, more than individual responses to the dilemmas that really confront us today. And this dilemma of war is, yes, it falls upon personal consciences. I was persuaded by your arguments about conscience and, and Blessed Franz's role within this and the possibility of generating, you know, individual conscientious, selective conscientious objection. But I want to say even more so, I was I was moved by how there, the idea of the court, 
or the idea of there being a body that could issue some kind of statement that can help individuals form their consciousness. It lifts that burden off the shoulders yeah. of individuals. And I, I certainly see in my own students at Loyola today, they are wonderful people, but they feel the burden of the many responsibilities that they have they have sense of falling yeah. upon their hearts these days. They feel these burdens really strongly. And so the idea that the church in this new way can be a, a response, can help them do this and help young warriors do this, men and women, um, I found myself very moved by. So I just want to say thank you as a sociologist and as a priest, thank you for your work. Thank you, Patty. Appreciate yeah, it. We'll, we want to say thank you also for your time here today. And uh, I know that we have a really lovely and you know aesthetically beautiful, a hopeful ending that uh, Dr. Murphy, Mike, you're going to help walk us through here. So I send it back to you. And let, yeah. let me say before Mike does that, just a big thanks to the Hank Center and Mike and Patty for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's been a, a lot of fun. I obviously um, care a lot about this issue and want people to encounter the ideas. And this has been a great opportunity to do that. So thank you very much. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bergman and Father Gilger, Roger and Patty. Thank you so much. Uh, it was so wonderful to see you kind of back in the, had the band back together again, as it were. <laughs> uh, but more, I think more importantly, um, I get so many texts and messages during this conversation about what life you brought to it, a very needed conversation. You know, if, if we were in person, we would be selling books in the back corner of the room. Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> and, and so I do want to encourage people, these, right there, Patty has Thank it you. up. Preventing <laughs> Unjust War, available online. There it is. <laughs> And we do have to honor your friend and our friend, the great Jesuit, Drew Christensen of, of Blessed Memory, yeah. who, who writes a wonderful introduction and then really has me, my interest peaked on your chapter on moral injury, which is I'm, I'm going to run out and do that. So um, thank you, Roger, for that. Um, what, what, what can I say also? Thank you to Patty uh, Delgado and Adam High. Uh, Adam's our graduate uh, assistant. Patty's our, our center manager. They're, they're great. But thank you to our viewers. Um, for taking the time and, and entering into our conversation. It, it's become kind of a pattern at the Hank Center to conclude our talks with, a, with poetry, right? You know, uh, Frost said poetry is what gets left out in translation, uh, which is shorthand for saying that poetry is, you know, that's the way it's, that's the only way it can be said is via a poem sometimes. Raj and I were talking about Seamus Heaney and, and his great uh, anti-war poetry, I was going to read one from Heaney, who's a favorite of mine, but in light of yesterday's events, I kind of went a different direction. So here it is from 1925, uh, Robinson Jeffers, great California poet, anti-war poet, much more. His poem is Shine, Perishing Republic, again, from 1925. While this America settles in the mold of its vulgarity, heavily thickening to empire and protest, only a bubble in the molten mass pops and sighs out, and the mass hardens. I, sadly smiling, remember that the flower fades to make fruit, the fruit rots to make earth. Out of the mother and through the spring exultances, ripeness and decadence, and home to the mother. You making haste, Haste on decay, not blameworthy. Life is good, be it stubbornly long or suddenly a mortal splendor. Meteors are not needed less than mountains. Shine, perishing republic. But for my children, I would have them keep their distance from the thickening center, corruption, never has been compulsory. When the cities lie at the monster's feet, there are left the mountains. And boys, be in nothing so moderate as in love of man. A clever servant, insufferable master. There is a trap that catches noblest spirits that caught, they say, God when he walked the earth. Thank you one and all for attending and blessings to all. Thanks.